Hello! Hi! Welcome back to our zoo, sorry, uh, our studio. After trotting around the world and racking up the air miles. And of course, do you think we come back with anything other than a bang? Not a chance. Dave, what's in the show? DC rounds up the news from this year's Farnborough International Air Show. Philip Steinbeck shows off his Extreme s back 342. And we have some of the stars from the Little Gransden Air Show. But first, Rich with the news. Start with a new aircraft, one that really caught our eye was the Technam P2010. Now it's just in concept and design stage at the moment, won't be seen until next year's Aero Friedrich Show 2011. Broadly speaking it's a Cessna 172 rival, a 4 seat high wing and a composite fuselage, around about $390,000 book price. Really look forward to seeing that at the show next year. Now a little bit of industry news, Frank Robinson of course, the stalwart of helicopter design, man that really pushed training in helicopters onwards with the cheap R22 and then of course the big R44, he has finally decided to retire. He'll be just a few days short of 81 years old when he officially hands over the reins to his son Kurt. Best of luck with the golf game Frank. Now talking of golf, it's time for the sports news. First of all, congratulations Paul Bonham, the first ever Red Bull pilot to win back-to-back -back championships. With the races cancelled in Budapest and Portugal, the final round was at the Lausitz Ring in Germany. It was Hannes Ark that took the chequered flag in Germany, with Paul Bonham finishing in second place. But, as Paul had flown so consistently over the whole season, he'd already won the championship, and we'll be talking to him in just a moment. Now, aside from the racing, the end of the year itself was overshadowed by two quite tragic events. Just a few days before the Lausitz Ring race, the series technical director Adrian Jodd was tragically killed in a motorcycle accident in Germany. Just a few days after the series had ended, Alejandro McLean, one of the most popular pilots, pilot from Spain, was killed in an aerobatic practice session back in his homeland. All our commiserations go to his family and friends. Later on, Red Bull themselves revealed that there will be no Red Bull Championship in 2011, so for the time being, Paul Bonham's going to remain the reigning champion for some time. Now to talk to us about what truly has been a really grueling season, we have Paul Bonham on the phone. Hi Paul, how are you doing? Yeah, good, very good. Congratulations on the championship, Paul. As we all know, it's been quite an eventful season. How would you sum it up? Um, I would say uh, interesting. The highlight for me was New York with such a fantastic backdrop. We had our fair share of drama in Perth and Windsor, of course, with the incidents in the water. But I think that took the limelight away from what was also a very, very good year for, for exciting racing. So I'm very pleased that we finished this year on a high as far as the racing was concerned. After my flunk years of 07 and 08, it, it's great to be able to win the back-to-back -back championship. So how do you feel about the races being put on hold for next year? There's a bit of me that's disappointed because it means you know, we can't keep going on a roll, but on the other hand, there's a bit of relief as well, because it is incredibly hard work. I've been racing for seven years now, and it's going to be nice to have a bit of a break from it. As we all know, the Red Bull series is a really close-knit community, and you lost two friends at the end of the season. How's that affected everyone? One thing I do think is uh, incredibly sad about this, this year is that we always have a few beers at the end of the last race celebrate the fact that A, we've had good races and also that we're all still there and sadly this year that wasn't the case because of Adrian Judd and his tragically sad accident and then of course, you know, a week later uh, we, we hear the news that Alex has crashed his edge in Spain two, two very big characters from the race are sadly no longer around to uh, celebrate with us it really is a tragic end to a tough year. Thanks very much for your time, Paul. Much appreciated. I hope to speak to you soon. Yeah, all right, Dave, no worries. And um, see you around somewhere soon. So, back to this summer and this year's aviation shows. Of course, you will have seen us at Oshkosh. I hope. But don't be thinking only Americans do big, spectacular shows because, of course, Farnborough, which comes on every two years in the UK, is one of the true giants of world aviation. Commercial airline, there's mostly a lot of military stuff, but really something for everyone that loves aviation. So who better than Oman DC to go down and have a right good look around. Boeing chose to give its 787 Dreamliner its world public debut here at Farnborough, an indication of the high esteem in which the show's held. Farnborough is Europe's top civil and military air show, held every two years, alternating with Paris. The appeal of the Farnborough show is the mix of aircraft 
from the Dreamliner and the military transporter from Airbus, alongside the extra 300s of the Blades team and the latest fighters from the US and Europe. Big Business is done at Farnborough. It's the meeting place for the powerhouses of the aerospace industry. So, to the star of the show, the Boeing Dreamliner. Thompson Fly has come out as an early customer for the Dreamliner. Many more are expected. What they like are the low operating costs and the nice touches for the passengers. For example, the windows, pretty cool. You just press this button and they lighten or darken according to what you want. It's going to be an awesome passenger experience. But what's it like for the guy at the sharp end? We're here talking to Captain Mike Bryan, who flew the aircraft over from Seattle. Is that a non-stop flight? Yes, absolutely. It was yeah. our first time to leave uh, the United States and uh, come back to to Farnborough, I've been there before in a different uh, airplane, the F-18, and just, just had a wonderful flight over. The plane performed beautifully um, and just came in right on time. I think we were about 90 seconds off target time. Where does this aircraft sit in the Boeing range? Similar to a 767, yeah. um, so around the 8,000 mile range, filling that area. The route that Airbus has taken with the 380, going big, landing at uh, hub airports, whereas this has taken a different approach. This airplane is in the Boeing philosophy of flying where it's needed, and we just got the approach of going for very efficient airplanes with uh, very efficient engines. Uh, we've got the new designs for both the Rolls and the GE engines. We've got the composites. It's a combination of, of the airplane design, the systems, the engines, and all coming together with a targeted design to, to optimize with a very modern airplane. This is Boeing's first composite airliner. Does it fly any differently? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, we've got flight control system that we've improved on from the 777. You, you put a 777 pilot in here, uh, he, he, he can't tell, it's just better. We have better response when an engine fails. Um, uh, it's just a bit smarter, but when you get down to the piloting controls and the way that it flies and handles and lands, um, it's just a beautifully flying airplane. There's obviously a lot of passenger friendly developments in this airplane. Are there any for the pilots as well? If you've seen the flight deck, I think you'll, you'll agree there are. The, the 15 inch displays, you can move the systems around, your, your situational awareness, the, the two head up displays. Uh, the roominess of where you're standing, it, it, it's, a, it's a really nice flight deck. It, it, it's not cramped, it's, it's modern, and it was a pleasure to fly over. When will this aircraft go to service, do you think? We're working on our test program. We're, we're going uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, getting it completed. As soon as we finish that, get it into service as fast as possible. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Over budget, we're talking billions of euro here, late and now reported to be overweight as well. The Airbus A400M military transport plane hasn't had a happy start in life, but Airbus, the makers, refuse to be Les Miserables about it. They say they're going to try and sell it to the Americans, try and make up for some lost profit. Ha! It's my fly. Farnborough isn't just about airliners and fighter jets, it's also about helicopters. And this morning, Augusta Westland launched the AW169, brother to the AW139. It's a multi-mission, multi-role helicopter. The AW169 light twin is aimed at the growing police and emergency services market. Its avionics will be the latest for maximum situational awareness and all weather operations. The cockpit is NVG, that's night vision goggle compatible, and a four-axis auto flight control system is included to minimise crew workload. It was also the UK debut for Augustus Grand New, the latest version of the Grand, with a full glass cockpit, synthetic vision, four-axis autopilot, new cleaner engines and seats with better crash protection. General Aviation has its place at Farnborough as well, with manufacturers like Diamond launching a UAV version of their DA42, and this, a DA42 powered by biofuel derived from algae. Pond life has its place. The algae biofuel is said to contain one-eighth the level of hydrocarbons, 
meaning less pollution and greater efficiency. It's a joint project between Diamond and EADS, the aerospace giants, tackling head-on future fuels. Farnborough is the home of British Aviation and it's a hugely important show. All the world's industries here doing deals, selling things and proving that aerospace is a vital British industry. This has just been a quick taste of the show. If you'd like to see more, see the next edition of P1. Thanks DC, and of course all the news from the show will be in the September issue of P1. If you want to get your hands on a copy, then www.loop.aero is the place to be. Well, it's all well and good seeing the new Airbus and Boeing, great for travelling across continents, but if you want to go somewhere, perhaps do a little bit of aerobatic when you get there or on the way, how about something a little bit more extreme? Now, new aerobatic aircraft don't come along very often, in fact they come across about ooh, once every decade or even two. There is a new one in town, however, it's this, it's the Extreme Air SBAC 342. It's a development of the SBAC 300. The guy that designed this, Philip Steinbeck, is the German national champion, pretty handy designer too. This is a two-seater cleared for unlimited championship level. When it's certified, it'll be the first of its type to be fully carbon fibre throughout in the world. So in the world of aerobatics, what you need is a huge engine up front, this does, it's a Lycoming Thunderbolt 580. You need big wing area, this has more wing area than an edge or an extra. And this, you'll see, it has full width ailerons. That gives an unprecedented level of control and snap stops when you're coming out for a roll, going into them in the first place. Now, of course, being a two-seater with something a range of up to about a thousand miles, is it big inside? Well, let's have a quick look. What you see is this. They've started out with the competition seating here, and this is pretty much where it would be in the single seater as well. However, fuselage in this version is 11 inches longer, slightly under, plenty of room up front for a very tall second pilot, which in this case will be me. So for this new entrant into the unlimited category, there's nobody better than the Britain's leading aerobatic unlimited pilot, Joe Cooper, to test it. What's this like for life? Well, um, it's nice to see a new clean sheet design, really, and the aeroplane is as it looks. It's fast, it's strong, and very, very manoeuvrable. The exciting thing is, even for a two-seater, it's got the power-to-weight ratio comparable to a single-seater, such as the Stockcat 232s. It has the same level of manoeuvrability, probably faster in roll, more rigidity in the structure overall, so the aeroplane feels very, very solid and, and, and gives you that sort of positive feedback. The, the ailerons are very, very effective, particularly at high speed, um, but also, more importantly, when you're going slowly, the ailerons extend right into the prop wash, so even with absolutely no speed at all, literally on the airspeed indicator, the ailerons are still very, very effective and can rotate the aeroplane. Philip, how did this project come about? The idea for it came in 2003 when I was still flying on another aeroplane. There were a lot of detailed ideas coming up how to improve it. And so we started actually building the prototype in December 2005. Basically the, the start was really to have a light plane with good range, with a comfortable cockpit, with classic and uh, freestyle capabilities. It's amazing what this aeroplane can do. <laughs> you now have what will be the first fully certified fully carbon fibre aircraft in the world. How strong is it? Well, basically the plane is designed so it's unbreakable in the air. We made the ultimate load test recently in Czech Republic up to 18G. It was quite impressive to see because 18G on this plane equals some 16 tonnes on the wings. The, the wing itself is 75 kilos, so you can imagine the strength ratio of it. And this is the only plane in the market where you can legally deflect the ailerons at VNE, that means 225 knots. And even the aileron has a safety margin of uh, more than three, so that means if you would be stupid enough to deflect the aileron at 260 knots, you still would not lose them, but you would be, in fact, quite impressed by the roll rate. And uh, I doubt that anybody can break this plane in flight ever. I hope.
everybody coming from a super, it's quite an easy transition. You do the stall turns the other way, but everything like snap technique is really much, pretty much the same. For everybody coming from extra, and um, it's a little change because the elevator is more sensitive, all the control surfaces are more sensitive. Everybody coming from a Cup 232 or Super 26 would be just fine. We ride from the first takeoff a quite solid feel because there's nothing vibrating, there's no fabric that could move on the back. And in general, we put cameras all over the plane and measured all the, deflection, all the deformations with strain gauges. You can't see any deformation on the airframe in flight at all. So it's, uh, there is some stress, of course, but the plane is made for stiffness, not for strength, so it's severely overbeefed. Essentially, it can be a tour up, flat out two up, running it at full power. It's indicating over 200 knots. You know, now that is a respectable speed. Obviously, it comes at a price in terms of fuel burn, but the reality is you've got an aeroplane there that will do a five-hour hit at an economical cruise of 170, 180 knots. So the aeroplane is very, very capable in two-seat terms and is quite tame and quite stable also. So it's very responsive, but when left as a sort of cruising platform, it's quite stable. But if you do want to go crazy for half an hour, you know, it is literally a, a cage fighter, really. Massive thanks to Gerald for levering himself into the hot seat. Also to Philip Steinbach for giving us a huge amount of accommodation and showing us around his frankly amazing aircraft. And of course, the guys at Wickenby Aerodrome for hosting the toughest guy on the block, me. Now, although Rich claims to be the toughest bloke on the block, I think not. A few brave pilots turned up at Little Gransden and battled interesting conditions to put on a show for a 3,000 strong crowd all in aid of children in need. Here are some of the highlights.
job guys, well done. You can still donate to Children in Need by visiting www.littlegransdenshow.co.uk and the show will be on again next year at the same date, the August bank holiday, so put the date in your diary. Now, in terms of diary dates for 2011, I'm hoping, of course, that you have put EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh in that diary. Yes, of course, we spent a considerable amount of time looking at the world's biggest aviation show. And if you haven't seen our footage of it here, shame on you. Have you been looking at pictures of cats being put into bins? Have a look round, check out some of the best bits. And if you haven't been there, have a look at some now. And as always, if you have any comments or suggestions for the show or ideas for features, then drop us a line at tv at loop.aero. See you in a month. Goodbye.